Before beginning the physical examination, the examiner first introduces themselves, clarifies their role, confirms the patient's identity, and explains the intended examination using patient-appropriate language. The examiner gains consent, offering to provide a chaperone if this is appropriate, and washes their hands. For a detailed description of how to prepare for a physical examination, refer to the course Preparation for Physical Examination. To perform an examination of the abdomen, the patient is positioned supine on the examination couch, either lying flat or with one pillow under their head. Exposure is from the xiphys sternum to the pubic symphysis and the chest wall should ideally also be uncovered. The groins and genitals should be easily accessible but can remain covered until the relevant stage of the examination. A general assessment of the patient is first made, both from the end of the bed and from the patient's right, in order to gauge their overall level of health, level of pain and level of mobility. The presence of any adjuncts, such as monitoring equipment, is noted. Physiological parameters should also be checked if equipment is available. A focused general examination is then performed. Starting at the hands, the examiner looks for peripheral signs of infection, features of chronic liver disease, evidence of nutritional and hydration status, and can also assess for the presence of finger clubbing and a flapping tremor or asterixis. Moving cranially, assessment for lymphadenopathy is also performed, in particular palpating for an enlarged left-sided supraclavicular lymph node known as Verkhoff's node classically associated with metastatic gastric cancer. A palpable node in the left supraclavicular fossa is known as Toisier's sign and should always warrant further investigation. The face is then examined, looking again for general signs of systemic pathology, such as conjunctival pallor, weight loss and the presence of jaundice. For a detailed description of the various components of a general examination, refer to the course General Examination and Vital Signs. The abdominal wall is next carefully inspected, looking for evidence of abdominal distension, the presence of scars, distended vessels, and any visible pulsations or swellings, as well as for more obvious abnormalities, such as the presence of drains or stomas. Movement of the abdomen with respiration and movement of the chest wall are also assessed. In the context of generalized peritonitis, respiratory effort may become reduced and breathing may become shallow, and the patient may tense or even physically splint the abdominal wall in an attempt to avoid pain. The lateral abdominal wall and flanks are also inspected, looking for scars, bruising and other skin abnormalities. To better visualise the flanks and also expose the posterior abdominal wall and sacral area, the patient is asked to lean forward. If indicated, the renal angles can also be checked at this point for tenderness. With this manoeuvre, an umbilical hernia can also be better appreciated. Similarly, inspection can be performed as the patient is asked to cough or lift the head off the bed, increasing intra-abdominal pressure and stretching the parietal peritoneum, looking to evoke sudden pain or discomfort suggesting peritoneal irritation and observing for any bulging suggestive of hernia. Auscultation of the abdomen is next performed, listening with the diaphragm of the stethoscope at at least two positions for the intermittent gurgling sounds of normal bowel movement. Peristaltic sounds typically occur episodically at roughly 5 to 10 second intervals, but the examiner should listen for a full two minutes before concluding that bowel sounds are reduced or absent. An absence of bowel sounds can indicate intestinal paralysis, usually in the context of abdominal distension. If large amounts of fluid and gas have accumulated, sounds can change in quality to tinkling, higher-pitched sounds, a worrying clinical sign of progressive obstruction.